ask whether any of you has some well, idea about what this might be, um, what do, do, do you have any expectations? Not really. Well, I expect it would have something to do with genetic sequencing. Yes, yes, very much so. That's uh, very good that you say that because that's the the, the, the section of bioinformatics that I've uh, that, that I'm going to focus on. Um, so, anyone else? Probably had a little bit of experience in text mining of uh, research papers and yeah. so on in connection with bioinformatics, but that's a very small area. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that is indeed also a field that is, well, in a maybe somewhat looser sense, um, uh, counted as bioinformatics. Um, uh, well, I uh, maybe can I also just say because it's a small group. Please just feel free to ask or interrupt or well, any time, uh, because well, this is an interdisciplinary topic, and I know from my own experience that in these topics, well, um, there will always be things that that are maybe rather less expected or comprehensible to you, and if that happens, just please do shout. Okay, so um, to move into the um, subject here where there are various definitions of bioinformatics, the, so I'm, I'm standing in the way of my own um, slides here. Um, so the, 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 the strictest one maybe is uh, that bioinformatics is a science that um, uh, focuses on information in biological systems as the object that is being studied. Um, in a somewhat looser sense, where well, any computational um, analysis of bio biological data could be called bioinformatics. And that means that, well, there's hardly any bioscience going on these days that does not in one way or other involve an aspect of bioinformatics. And then thirdly, also any computer-assisted mining of the biological literature is something that is sometimes uh, well uh, called bioinformatics or entering the bioinformatics areas in terms of conferences um, and um, uh, the, the, the literature itself. Um, so I'm going to mainly focus on um, aspects of sequence analysis and I'm going to introduce this topic very briefly. Um, well, just to give you a bit of a flavor of what these sequences are, I'm then going to well, zip past two uh, uh, pieces of research that I've been involved in myself. Um, the rest of this talk is not specifically something that I would have uh, developed in an algorithmic way. I'm very much a user of this, and well, in, in specific ways, I then use um, um, algorithms and, and, and tools to the specific um, inquiries that, or the, the specific items of research that I'm involved in, but I, I'm, I'm certainly not an algorithmic person. My background originally is in the biosciences, and I think that shows to this day, although my fellow bioscientists sometimes think otherwise. Um, so in terms of um, molecular uh, basics, um, most of you will have seen one way or the other, if only at CSI movies, maybe mm -hmm. the, 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 the famous double helix um, of DNA, which is the, the molecular medium of storage of genetic information in terms of these um, molecular structures, which I'm not going to go into in any greater detail. The only remark I would like to make is that um, <clears throat> these bases um, they come in pairs that are complementary. The AT pair and the GC pair are complementary, and in order for such a double helix to form, the strands have to be uh, complementary and they also have to be anti-parallel, so they have to run in opposite directions. Um, so we have these sequences of ACs, Gs and Ts, uh, leading to the question, what's the purpose of this in the context of the biological system? Now this is going to be a whole series of lectures which I'm not going to give, I'm just going to make you remind some of you of what you may have seen uh, before, which is called the central dogma. So the, organ the, 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 the genetic information is organized in, um, uh, in, in pieces called genes. These genes are then transcribed into another nucleic acid sequence, so that is basically just um, using the complementarity. And these are then translated to proteins, which are a whole different class of molecules that um, uh, perform all the biological functions um, uh, that, um, uh, 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 that, that we may or even may not be aware of. 
So just as a simple example, when um, uh, after the, uh, the talk today, we are going to have the, um, the, the, the Christmas reception. I understand that's going to be the next uh, point in the program. Um, and you have a glass of wine, then what's going to happen is that in response to that, some gene that encodes an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase will get activated and that will then lead to that protein being made in your liver and that's why after having a nice glass of wine today you can go sober to work tomorrow. <laughs> right, um, okay, so but with this let me get back to the topic of bioinformatics and the, um, and, and the sequences. Now the, the reason we can get at this is because um, the biological information itself is organized in a digital way so we can go from these rather complex molecular structures and store it as strings of these four letters A, C, G and T. And that's why bioinformatics is such a successful and, um, 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 and active field um, uh, um, of research. Now success is something that is a very good thing but sometimes you can have too much of a good thing uh, which I mean to say that um, uh, the, the amount of sequences that is becoming available uh, makes it increasingly difficult to handle it and well, leads to, to increasing challenges. Um, and um, uh, well, this is just one figure according to which we are now entering well, the tens of terabytes, that is the petabyte um, area, if we take all the uh, sequence information together that is available worldwide. Um, now the sort of properly curated sequence information is rather less but it's also growing and, uh, and uh, well it's um, uh, not really any longer possible to put this onto well I mean certainly not on a computer like this one and well this is another um, uh, graph that I show in order to point out that a new technology called next generation sequencing is what increasingly leads to this growth of um, uh, uh, of sequence information that becomes available and I will go into that in more detail later on. So, uh, like I said, just a few um, uh, 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 illustrations of the type of research um, uh, that's, um, that's based on, uh, on sequence information. One that I've been involved with uh, is the resolution of the phylogeny of land plants. So there are three groups of land plants. There are the and fungus and flowering plants, um, there are the gymnosperms, well this time of year everyone knows what that is, that's a Christmas tree, and um, well then there's a rather less well-known small group of plants called the Penitales, and the um, uh, plant scientists have wondered for a long time, are these more closely related to the flowering plants, or are they more closely related to the gymnosperms? So I mean, based on these pictures, I mean, would you have any any hunch what might be more likely? Well, you wouldn't know from the shape, would you? Anyway? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it is difficult to to, to say from the yeah, yeah, from the from the outward appearance, the so-called phenotypes. So, where people have, have started looking at the sequence information when that became available, but that was kind of inconclusive for a while as well. But the group that I was with at the time looked at a specific. Uh, family of genes, the MET protein encoding genes that, uh, 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 that that play a key role in organizing morphogenesis of flowers. And that's why this has diversified into these various groups that have all these names that I'm not going to go into. Um, so what I've um, uh, uh, highlighted here are the Vitalis genes in um, black and the gymnosperm green uh, the genes with a, with a gray background. And if we look at just a few of these subfamilies, we see that, well, it's always the case that the Knitalis um, um, group with the gymnosperms, so this is for the Agnes subfamily, this is for the AGL6 subfamily, and then the most interesting one is the Def and Glow subfamily, which is split into, well, these two subfamilies in the flowering plants, but in the gymnosperms and in the um, uh, in the Knitalis, that is not the case. They end up being a sister group to this uh, group of two um, subfamilies. So we could then conclude that um, uh, uh, it is the case that the um, uh, um, uh, Knitophytes are more closely related to the 
coniferous, that is the, the, the gymnosperms, then to the flowering plants. Um, and that is, um, so, so, so that decades long debate has finally been concluded. Um, along quite similar lines, applying the same basic logic, um, some research that I'm involved with at this point is um, uh, looking into transmission trees of uh, foot and mouth disease, which is one of those diseases affecting uh, well, predominantly cattle, but also all cloven hoofed animals. So the different colored fields here are uh, uh, symbolizing different premises of farms. And if there is an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, then it will start somewhere and then one and we will infect the next, and of course, we'll, it, it can also spread in the, in the across different uh, premises. So the question then becomes, um, uh, if we only sample a few animals, um, uh, so, uh, sorry, I mean, what, what, what we want to, to find out is the transmission tree at the farm level. And we ask the question, if we only sample a few animals, well, I mean, this could lead to a rather different tree if we just reconstruct this tree based on the sequences collected from that, um, um, from these animals, and we'd end up with a few edges that are not compatible with a true farm level transmission tree. But of course, we could also be lucky and it could work out. So the question is, which is most likely? So we, uh, 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 we end, uh, what we've done is a statistical analysis. Well, this is just the, um, the, the, the specifics of the data that we've been working with. Um, uh, in which we constructed 1,000 random samples such that there's only one animal representing or one sample representing each of these uh, the, these sites. And uh, these were then converted to Hamming distances. Then there is, a, there is an algorithm called TCS to construct gene genealogies from the sequences via the Hamming distances which then has to be made into a transmission tree for which there are various approaches that we formalized. Um, and uh, as we've been working on this, well, I said that, well, why don't we just forget about all this TCS complicated business and just use a minimum spanning tree. So I threw that in the mix as well. And what we found uh, when we, uh, we analyzed this then in terms of um, the topologies being generated, so going up to well 160 or so, um, uh, and also looking at the difference between the generated topologies and the true tree that we know in this case. So this does not look too good, even when, when, the, when the most frequent topologies will have well up to four or six um, edges that are not consistent with the true tree that we know. This looks somewhat better. This looks rather better. Um, so this is sort of the best we get out of the TCS system. And lo and behold, the, 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 the minimum spanning tree um, well, does even marginally better, and well, particularly it does not generate such a huge amount of different topologies, which I think in itself is also quite an advantage. So sometimes it turns out um, advance in well, programming or computing in bioinformatics is going back to the basics and simplifying things. Um, okay, so let's look into, well, how are these um, uh, computations really done? How do we get at the sequences and what are we doing with them? So the most fundamental thing that you can do with two sequences is to compare them. That is one of the fundamental approaches in science. And so uh, the, pro the, 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 the so-called problems of the pairwise alignment of which there exist many variations in bioinformatics. So the problem is as follows. We have two sequences, S and T, and we have some alignment algorithm that I'm going to now unpack for you in the next couple of minutes, uh, that then is supposed to output um, aligned sequences, S, so superscript A and T, superscript A, such that in some way the symbols that are matching uh, are, are written in the same color. So does that make sense so far? Trying to compare sequences, finding the symbols that are homologous, that are in fact um, going back to the same common ancestor. That is the biological principle behind this. So um, 
uh, well, just formally we have um, uh, 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 we distinguish between matches where the, the symbols are the same and that's in a sense what we want uh, but what we have to incur uh, is so-called gaps or what spaces uh, also called indels sometimes for ins insertions and deletions and uh, there's also mismatches uh, that sometimes cannot be avoided if the strings aren't exactly the same obviously um, so this leads to the question how do we identify which alignment is better there are all obviously many ways to construct them and well, in fact there's an awful lot of them as you see in a minute um, uh, and the answer to uh, well how do we define this is well we score them and essentially where there's a score for matches and for mismatches and for gaps and we add them all up and that's the score that we are trying to optimize so we have now made this into an optimization problem that can then be computationally tackled um, one way this cannot be done um, is by just trying out, out all the lines because uh, there's an awful lot of them and well, uh, I uh, ask you to trust me that I mean anything with these combinatorial expressions is really not feasible. Um, but um, it's been noticed uh, that um, uh, there is a, a particular property of these optimal alignments which is that any prefix also has to be optimal because otherwise we could find a better prefix and then glue just the rest of it to it and that would lead to a contradiction to the statement that it, it's been an optimal alignment that we've been starting with. So all these prefixes have to be optimal as well and that leads to a dynamic programming approach to, um, in, in which basically a table of optimal alignments of all the prefixes of the sequences, one written horizontally and the other one vertically here um, and at the lower right um, uh, corner of that table, we then find what the optimal score is. Um, but what uh, I ask you to notice is that, well, quite obviously, looking at this um, n by n or n, uh, 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 table here, this is, uh, is, is still n squared complexity. Um, so well, from, from finding the optimal score, we can then use a process called backtracking to find what the alignments are. So that is how sequences are compared. And the rest of my talk here on sequence analysis is going to be focused on, well, this is not always good enough. It is quite a clever thing. It is a very traditional thing. Anyone in a bioinformatics program will, will maybe even get to code up uh, the basic version of the, uh, of, of the Needleman Wunsch or uh, Smith Waterman alignment. But in many cases, this is not good enough. Because remember that where well, there's this big data volume of sequences and one problem that frequently arises is when well, I've got a sequence, I've gotten it out of my favorite pet organism. Um, and what is it? Has anyone else found it before me? Or is there something similar in another organism in one of the so-called model organisms for which the complete genome sequences have been determined? Sorry, can I ask a very naive question? Yes, sure. Does this relate to when you see people having the pictures with the dark lines on them and you see them visually trying to align? No. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the picture with the dark lines, the, 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 these, this is a traditional way of determining sequences. I, well, if, if you use that, well, these so-called autoradiographs for sequencing, well, you wouldn't want to align them visually. Uh, there are other gels that also lead to these, well, with the same kind of autoradiographs. And then there you may sometimes try to, well, more or less literally try to, to superimpose them to, or to, well, more likely uh, find bands or lanes of these that end up at the same level and therefore are then indicative of the same molecule. Um, uh, but when well, this is a slightly different um, uh, molecular technique. Um, uh, but yes, in principle, it is that, um, as I'm going to show you though, for particular next generation sequencing, the technology has moved on, and, well, as many people say, has been quite revolutionized um, since the days of um, uh, we're looking at the Sanger sequencing gens. But yes, well, uh, I mean, you're quite right. And in fact, in the well, sort of the bonus material that I've put to the end of this, I, I do have a picture of that, I think. Um, so if anyone's interested in that sequencing process, I can 
maybe um, talk about that as well. Yeah. Yes. In, in the previous step, you had a scoring for matches, mismatches. Is, is that scoring empirical, or does it come from? Um, well, that is a very good question. Uh, this is just a simple example to introduce the alignment problem, and uh, well, so just to come up with simple numbers, I use a match score of plus one, gap penalty or space penalty of minus two, and a mismatch penalty of minus one. In actual truth, well, what everyone does is there are similarity matrices that will give a score for each possible pair of symbols, and then there is a gap penalty, a gap creation penalty, and the gap extension penalty. So the uh, the, the alignment algorithm that is actually being used is somewhat more complex, but these are fairly straightforward extensions once uh, uh, where you've, got, uh, you, you've worked out the basics of this dynamic programming approach. So that's why I'm, I mean, this is, this is sort of from teaching material that I'm using, so therefore it's a, it's a, it's a you know, simplified example. Um, but if you remember the, uh, the, the four bases, where two of them have two rings, they are sort of the so-called pure ring bases, the other have just one ring of, well, I mean, a hexagon or pen, a pentagon ring, um, uh, there are the so-called pyramidine bases, and these between each other, well, are more similar and therefore incur less of a penalty than is this empirical scoring that, well, probably you had in mind. So that is, well, I mean, what actually is done. Yeah. Sorry, uh, follow Yes, sure. Yeah. Follow up. If you actually, well, how are we in school this? If you have you analyzed what happens if you change the scoring system, do you actually come up with the same the same matching? Or can you actually go down if you how sensitive is the scoring? So if you if you make a small change to the scoring, does it give you radically different matches or not? Um, it shouldn't um, uh, if you're um, well as you can see the scoring uh, well is is a sum so well if if you change the um, uh, uh, well uh, I mean, the, the, these individual well, similarity scores just a little bit, uh, the, well, the, the alignment often will not change at all. Um, it is, however, the case, particularly choosing these gap extension and gap creation penalties that can make a bit of a difference. And I think it is quite striking that this is a question that has been, well, it's been discussed in, in, in specialist communities, but when most people use the, the default parameters almost all of the time, well, including myself. Um, well, there is well, a bit of a reason that, well, I mean, everyone else does it, so if you want to write a paper and you do something exceedingly clever, I mean, then you just get yourself into a position where you then have to justify that. Whereas if you just run the program as it comes out of the box and everyone else does it, well, that's the <laughs> path of least resistance, right? Uh, uh, and like I said, I'm quite guilty of that myself. But, um, uh, well, I have looked into that at times, um, particularly in the context of tree reconstruction, where then the, problem, the, 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 the question I ended up with is, well, does it affect the, the, the resulting tree? And, well, it didn't to, 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 to well, I mean, not, in, not with respect to the, to the key features of the tree, such as the, the split of the deaf glow group versus the, uh, the, well, these outgroups. And well, that is something that you can, and I think, well, personally, I think it should be done more, but uh, well, it's, um, um, uh, uh, it's not something that has caught on um, to that extent. Okay, so any further questions so far? So I'll okay. skip ahead to where I think I left. Um, which is that, yes, we, um, <clears throat> um, well, as I remarked, the basic alignment algorithm, um, uh, well, it still does have a, an n-square complexity. So if you want to run your sequence against all the, um, uh, whatever it is, billions of sequences in the public repositories, and some of them are very long, that is not good news. You can't do that. It's just not feasible. <clears throat> so, um, uh, as an alternative, um, <clears throat> uh, well, the tool that's nowadays being used uh, is called BLAST, which is well, a kind of a fancy acronym for basic alignment, basic local alignment search tool. Um, uh, and the idea here basically is, well, 
we are not going to run a full dynamic programming uh, alignment between the query and all the sequences in the database. Um, the idea is much rather that um, uh, we will look for um, gapless matches of small words and then try to extend from there to the to the left and to the right, if you like, in nowadays version, allowing uh, to a certain extent gaps to be inserted. And then where well, these so-called high scoring pairs um, can be combined into, uh, into, well, well, uh, into alignments. But these things are not proper alignments. Um, once you have found these matches, the recommendation most in, 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 in many circumstances is do a proper alignment with these in order to find out what the homology, homology really is. But um, by the, the, uh, starting with these seed word matches, um, the algorithm can be greatly sped up. <clears throat> and the most expensive part really is this extension because that is not so very unlike the alignment algorithm, although it is being, if you like, reined in a little bit, uh, well, I mean, quite some, in fact. But <clears throat> Um, it, um, uh, it is possible with that to, well, uh, in, a, in a matter of minutes, um, uh, uh, scan through the entire gene bank database. And in fact, um, there is a, a search engine of that sort um, uh, under that URL, uh, last.ncpi.nmh.gov, and um, uh, well, uh, Everyone doing molecular biology uh, ends up using this site. But sorry, I mean this is not very visible. But what, what happens is you, you paste your sequence into into a text area here, and then you click on the blast button, and that is in fact more or less like, like doing Google for for sequences. And then you get the similar sequences in in a graphical overview, and then you can drill into that. You can look at the, at the individual sequences if the resolution of the screen were better, and then you can also uh, look at these alignments <coughs> uh, as, it, as they are being produced by BLAS, and then of course you can also download the sequences and then further analyze them uh, to your heart's content. Uh, so that is what, what I would consider a quite sort of advanced programming, um, uh, a piece of programming that uh, well, has been put in place, um, and uh, organizations like the NIH, well, running the Gene Bank site, um, uh, or the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, near Cambridge. Um, uh, well, do operate this kind of system, and well, it's also well, well, well Blast is, is is a very mature system now. Uh, but but further facilities and services are being added uh, uh, quite actively all the time. Um, and well, I don't even have the time to go into uh, all of these uh, that there are. So with this, I'd like to. Well, uh, any questions about Blast? Well, like I said, yes, yes. One of the response times you paste it to. Uh, sequences in, you click the button. Yeah, and then what, what's going to happen is, uh, is some JavaScript piece will, will pull the site well, every 30 seconds or so, and after two or three minutes, you'll, you'll have the response. Um, and that's the whole point. It, it's a feasible time, and you do get a, a scan of the entire uh, uh, um, uh, uh, database of all the, all the publicly available sequences in these repositories. Um, <clears throat> there are some ways to try and run a more sensitive search, but um, my impression is that where well, this becomes less and less of an issue because as more and more sequences become available, uh, the, um, uh, the chances of having only very distant, uh, distantly related sequences to your sequence of interest um, uh, become less and less. Um, <clears throat> uh, the main concern um, uh, with um, uh, algorithms like BLAST is that if there are too many differences so that there's, there's nowhere such a short word that matches a, a sufficient score to trigger the entire search, well, then that match will be overlooked. And that is why they are well particularly much as I remember it, in the, um, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, where there was a whole uh, well, system of theories and on top of that a whole raft of rumors 
uh, as to how to how to come up with the most sensitive search. But this, where, where people nowadays are just using Blast, even though there may be better things available. I mean, it's a, well, even on that front, I would say quite comparable to Google. I mean, there may be better ways of searching the web, but I mean, everyone's just typing their, their, their queries into the Google bar. Okay. So anything further before we go to the next generation of sequencing? Okay, so then let me just jump right into that. Um, well, as I, as I remarked, the day and age of the, of the Sanger sequencing gel with the bands, uh, black bands on a, well, not quite white, grayish background, and, uh, uh, have long gone. But this has been uh, sort of refactored, if you like, uh, in, 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 into a system of capillaries uh, where then the intensities are uh, automatically measured. But more recently, um, uh, where people have come up with rather new ideas, uh, how to go about doing sequencing. Now, what these do, these next generation sequencing uh, methods, is they provide um, very short reads, but a very large number of these. The fact of the matter is, we're talking about sequences in gen uh, sequencing in general for a minute again, that quite contrary to what you might expect from a computer background, uh, when the, the genome or the, the sequence in a chromosome can notionally be thought of as like a tape, but unlike this in the computer as a file, say, you can't just go in and say, well, I would like to read out bases 1,360,000, whatever, to 1,500,000, one say, uh, and give me that. Yeah, that that's not possible. Um, and that's not how biology uh, works either. Um, so you can, but, but the sequences will always be fragmented. And that's also due to the molecular nature of things, where the, an extended sequence of a billion base pair um, uh, will, will be in the re region of, well, I mean, maybe less than a meter, but well, several centimeters, and at the same time have a diameter. If you think of the, of the DNA double helix of just, um, well, maybe 10, uh, 10, 10 nanometers or something of that sort. So it, it is a very delicate thing, and it will break as you handle it. Um, and then you can look at the sequence at the end of these breaks. What do you mean by very short? Well, what, uh, yeah, I'll get to that. Um, yeah. um, uh, uh, well, in fact, well, there are, uh, I mean, it started with uh, well, just a few dozen. Uh, my seed like this can go up to 250,000. I think they have well, cranked it up to 300, uh, sorry, 250, not 1,000. 250, that's all you get, yeah, 250. And I think they, 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 they maybe managed to notch it up another 100 or so, but it's, it's, it's um, um, uh, 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 well, that is the, the, the region. There is a new raft of technologies that will bring longer reads of up to, well, maybe several tens of thousands, but at this point, they produce an awful lot of errors. Um, uh, so that is um, an emerging technology. So um, you get those into a protein sequences that way? Uh, no, uh, well, you, you only ever get DNA sequences. Yeah, protein, no, I mean, you, you get about, you get, you get about this, the, the length of this DNA sequence would produce perhaps an average protein. It's certainly much more than the hormone protein. Um, well, um, I, I wouldn't be so certain that it, when the average protein had, has at least a few hundred amino acids, each amino acid is encoded by three bases. Yeah. So you, well, and then, I mean, on top of that, where well, there's yeah. also introns and exons and stuff. Yeah. Well, sorry, I mean, may, I, I think you may know what I'm talking about, but yeah. uh, where well, genes are in the, in the regions of, of tens of thousands of bases, okay. some of them are rather larger. Even. Yeah. So uh, these short reads will not sequence an entire gene, um, and they will most of the time anyway not contain the start of where of a gene. And if you don't know where the start is, then it's very difficult to get anything useful out of just a small sn snippet of sequences. So they have to be well somehow put together, and well, that's one of the things that I'm getting at. Um, so well, this is like I said, a new technology. Um, uh, uh, well, I've, I, I said, well, it's like 250 or so, what I mean by short, 
by very large, what I mean is millions that's going to come out of this desktop type of MySeq uh, uh, machine, uh, well, or up to a billion, where you may have heard in the news sort of recently about the, what's it called, HiSeq X10 or some fancy name you may have come up with, which is a cluster of the latest and greatest um, uh, uh, next generation sequencing machines and they're going to use that I think in the NI, uh, NHS or so to, to sequence an awful lot of human genomes um, uh, and um, uh, well, to, to, to analyze the variation in there and that's, uh, that's one of the new flagship pro uh, projects that, that's been um, well announced um, earlier this year. Um, uh, so it is really exceedingly large numbers. So just uh, very quickly to give you a bit of an idea of how this is done. It's all taking place on a, on a tiny kind of a flow chamber uh, uh, or the size of a microscopic glass slide. Um, sequences, like I said, are fragmented um, uh, and where well, then there are constant ends added to that. They are then, well, if you like, planted on the glass slide and from each of these sequences planted there by some process called bridge PCR, which I'm not going to go into any details, a whole cluster of molecules with the same sequences is produced, which can then be sequenced by attaching um, um, uh, one nucleotide at a time and then exciting the whole thing um, so, uh, 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 with, a, with a laser. And, uh, sorry, that's a, that's a laser here. Yes, but in any event, well, so, so, so the, uh, we get one snapshot uh, where each of the different bases will light up in a different color. Then the next base is attached. We get another slide and then we get a whole series of these, which can then be made uh, where into where each of these clusters um, uh, where, where is, is read out on each of the cycles. So, um,